Hello class, today we're going to finish discussing John Perry's dialogue on personal identity and immortality, The Third Night. Here's some study guide questions to help us get started. 1. Which medical procedure do Wyrob, Miller, and Cohen discuss at The Third Night's beginning? 2. Who are Julia North and Mary Frances Bodine, and what happens to them? 3. Which philosophical question arises from the case of these two people? 4. How do Miller and Cohen argue that Julia North survived? 5. How does Wyrob argue that Mary Frances survived? Okay, as always, when I review the answers to these questions, you might want to pause the video and write the answer down, type it up. Uh, spray paint it in lighter fluid and then light it on fire outside of your window or however it is that you're going to record the information so you can better compartmentalize all of it. So when we start on the third night, the three interlocutors, Miller, Cohen, and Wyrob, are talking about an experimental procedure and wondering whether it might save Wyrob's life. Gretchen Wyrob's body is deteriorating. She has some kind of condition that is going to destroy her health, but it won't damage her brain or her central nervous system at all. Now, in this fictional universe in which the dialogue takes place, there happens to be a medical procedure, an established medical procedure, for removing someone's brain and putting it in a different brainless body. They then discuss the case of Julia North and Mary Frances Bodine. Now, this is a fictional case. It's taken from a story called Who is Julia? Uh, but nonetheless, in this dialogue, we're going to pretend that it was a real sort of thing and wonder about its implications. It's what philosophers call a thought experiment. We'll have more to say about those on a different video. Julia North was a woman in the story who was hit by a runaway trolley. Her body was utterly destroyed. However, her brain and her central nervous system were intact. At the very same time on scene, a woman witnessed that accident, Mary Frances Bodine. She witnessed Julia North get hit by the trolley. In shock, she suffered a lethal stroke which destroyed her brain and central nervous system, but which left her body intact. In the story, a doctor or a team of doctors takes Julia North's brain and puts it in the body of Mary Frances Bodine. So let's imagine that. We've got Julia North and Mary Frances Bodine. How do I remember which is which? Well, I look at their initials. Julia North, J-N. After the trolley accident, she's just neurons. That's how I remember, that's the brain, is Julia North's brain, just neurons. As for Mary Frances Bodine, well, after her accident, she's just a body. So I use her initials too. So we've got Julia North's brain in Mary Frances Bodine's body and let's call the resultant person X. Now the philosophical question is, who is X? Is X Mary Frances Bodine with a new brain? Is X Julia North with a new body? Or is X neither one, some completely new person, in which case both of the aforementioned women died? That's the philosophical question raised by Julia North and correspondingly, it's the philosophical question raised when Y. Rob Miller and Cohen talk about this experimental brain procedure. Now, Miller and Cohen are hoping that their friend Gretchen Y. Rob survives. And so they're hoping that if you took Y. Rob's brain and put it in a new body, what you would have is Y. Rob, that she would have survived after all, just because her brain determines her identity. Y. Rob actually disagrees with this, though. She says that if you took her brain and put it in a different body, that wouldn't be her with a new body. That would be the same old person who owned that body now having a new brain. In the case of the Julia North story, Y. Rob would argue, and does argue, that Mary Frances Bodine survived. Miller and Cohen can't believe this, and they present arguments for why Julia North was the one who survived. One of the arguments, the argument Miller advances, attends to the behavior and the cognitive capacities of the person X. When X wakes up, X says, I am Julia North. X can recall the life of Julia North. X can remember everything that Julia North could have remembered before the trolley accident, and she behaves in a way that Julia North behaved. That's why Miller thinks that X is Julia North. We could phrase it formally this way. 
X can recall Julia North's life. If X can recall Julia North's life, then X is Julia North. So, X is Julia North. Why Rob rejects this argument? Why Rob says, no, it's no proof that it's Julia North. The fact that the person wakes up and says that they're Julia North doesn't show that they are. I mean, how else would you expect someone to behave when they get a new brain? You get a new brain, you go a little crazy. You think you're someone else for a while. But it's still Mary Frances Bodine, she argues. And she focuses on, again, the distinction between really remembering and seeming to remember. When X wakes up, says Y Rob, she only seems to remember Julia North's body. She doesn't really remember, for she is Mary Frances Bodine, just with a new brain. To understand Y Rob's perspective, think of having a heart transplant or a liver transplant. When you get a heart or a liver transplant, you don't lose your identity. It's not like the person who donated the heart then lives on using your body. No, you get a new part, but you stay the same person. And why Rob is thinking that way about a brain transplant? Sure, there are differences. Sure, as Miller points out, when someone gets a brain transplant, they claim to be another person. But why Rob says that's just a symptom of getting a new brain. That doesn't mean that you're a different person or anything. Cohen, on the other hand, appeals to that causal criterion of personal identity. Cohen notes that when Julia North had experiences, that was the world impinging on Julia North's brain. So that when Julia North later remembered experiences from earlier, that was a causal chain that mostly focused on her senses and her brain. When you take that brain and you put it elsewhere, the locus for memories and experiences, that thing which is causally connected to memories and experiences, moves. And if personhood is determined by the causal criterion, well then, it should be Julia North, for it's a continuation of her experiences. Formalized, Cohen's argument can be put like this. The memories of person X after the trolley accident are caused by the experiences of Julia North before the trolley accident. If the memories of person X after the trolley accident are caused by the experiences of Julia North before the trolley accident, then X and Julia North are the same person. So, X is Julia North. In response to this, Y Rob notes, well, first, she doesn't accept the causal criterion, and second, she provides a kind of argument why not. Against Cohen and Miller, Y Rob asks this question. What if only half of Julian North's brain survived? What if only half of it was good and salvageable? If you transferred that half into Mary Frances Bodine, would that make it Julia North? She asks this with the expectation that the answer will be yes. Why? Well, first of all, people can survive with half a brain. They can often function with half a brain. There are interesting studies and experiments about half brain studies and split brain studies, but it's possible. And in that case, the person X would wake up with half of Julia North's brain and person X would recall being Julia North. So, why Rob asks, if you just had half of Julia North's brain in Mary Frances Bodine, would you agree that it's Julia North? Miller starts to agree, but then Cohen interrupts and reminds Miller of why Rob's objection from before about duplication. If all it took to be Julia North was to have half of Julia North's brain, well then we have a problem. It would then be possible to take each of her brain's halves put them in different bodies, and voila, have two distinct people, which are, per absurdum, are the very same numerically single individual. No, 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 that just won't do. And because it won't do, concludes Y Rob, we should reject the idea that personal identity goes along with the brain. We should accept that it goes along with the body, and we should accept that X is Mary Frances Bodine. We can formalize Y Rob's argument like this. If personal identity is brain identity, then X would be Julia North even if X only had half of Julia North's brain. But if X would be Julia North even if X only had half of Julia North's brain, then there could be two distinct individuals, each of which is numerically identical to Julia North. But such a result is absurd, so person X cannot be Julia North with just half of Julia North's brain. So personal identity is not brain identity. 
And that's Wyrob's argument. Now, after Wyrob presents her argument, the three interlocutors argue and discuss, and Cohen and Miller point out that even if Wyrob doesn't really believe that the procedure will work, shouldn't she at least try it? Shouldn't she at least give it a shot? There's always the chance it might work. And Wyrob says no. She follows her reason, follows her arguments, and takes comfort in the fact that when she reasons her way through something, she knows that it's based on real reasoning, not just some vain hope. Miller and Cohen start to object, but then they observe, why Rob has already died. The end. Well, that's Perry's dialogue concerning personal identity and immortality. Again, it's a very popular, influential work. It's a very good work for discussing some of these more basic uh, philosophical concepts like numeric identity, personal identity, causal criteria, and things like that. Um, next time, we're going to start talking about some metaphysics of material constitution. I'll see you then. Thanks for watching.